stands a small engineering beacon. This monument records the achievements of one of New Zealand's outstanding pioneers. These days, the spine of the Southern Alps is an important wilderness area contributing to the great variety of New Zealand landscape that makes the country such a tourist attraction. But in the 19th century, the Alps formed an impenetrable barrier between the fertile Canterbury Plains with its farms and townships and the west coast with its timber and gold and coal. So, those first surveyors set out to conquer the mountains. It was Arthur Dobson who found the way through over here. And the name Arthur's Pass is synonymous with the perseverance of those early surveyors who on foot, in all weathers, over all types of terrain, sought out lines of communication right throughout New Zealand. Their tools for those exploratory surveys, notebook, compass, and a stout pair of boots, flax sandals when the boots wore out, for setting out roads and railways, bridges and tunnels, theodolite and chain measure. You've heard of chains and links, 80 chains to the mile, 100 links to the chain, Meters and kilometers today, there's no sense of history in them. Arthur Dobson was a member of one of the engineering families so typical of Victorian times. The Dobsons in New Zealand were the colonial equivalent of the famous father and son engineering teams of Britain. Members of the Dobson family were responsible for much of the survey work in the upper half of the South Island, establishing the engineering foundations for early settlement and development. But even before the Dobson's West Coast connection, this sort of work was going on all over New Zealand, often through the thickest bush country. Military expediency was often the reason for early roads in the North Island. One of the results of the land wars in Taranaki was the opening of the country for settlement. Frederick Carrington was the government engineer here. He was a great admirer of Roman engineering techniques. How did the Romans build their roads? You're right, straight across country. Carrington got away with this here because the centuries past activity of Mount Egmont cast great layers of volcanic ash over this countryside, ideal soil for cutting roads through. It was an era of pick, shovel and wheelbarrow engineering. But it's not only the alignment that's important. What makes a road last is the attention given to the foundations and to the road pavement. Road construction followed the principles of the great Victorian roadmaker John McAdam. Keep the surface waterproof and the native soil will carry the weight of traffic without the need for heavy foundations. Early road engineers had to master the engineering materials of a geologically young country, pushing roads through difficult terrain. So began a tradition for lightly constructed but easily maintained roading. In some cases, it may have been a bit too light. By the 20th century, New Zealand's road network was one of the most extensive in the world on a mileage per head of population basis. The reason was really to be found in the country areas. The pastoral economy on which this country depended for its early growth was vitally based on a good road system. And that tradition of light roading construction has left New Zealand engineers with a skill in assisting developing countries. This gives them an advantage over their colleagues in Europe and America used to heavier roading methods.
but modern urban traffic imposes enormous loads on a roading system. The last 30 years have seen the development of motorway design and construction equal to any in the world. How daunted those first settlers must have felt when they sailed in here in 1850 and were confronted by this barrier that separated them from the fertile plains. An obvious first solution was a bridle path over the port hills. But this was only an interim solution until a winding uphill road system was prepared. But to the pioneer engineers, it was steel roads that were the technology of the future. The railway boom in Britain had reached its peak, and the enterprising settlers in Canterbury arrived full of enthusiasm for this new form of transport. It was to be a railway between the port of Littleton and the city of Christchurch, gateway to the plains, it clearly could not go over these hills. Roads can climb quite steep gradients, but railways require gentle slopes to climb. So, was the answer a tunnel? The provincial engineer was Edward Dobson, father of young Arthur, the discoverer of Arthur's Pass, the gateway to Westland, way over there. Dobson recommended a tunnel. He took his tunnel proposal all the way back to Britain to confer with Robert Stevenson, the great British railway engineer. Stevenson endorsed the idea. The decision to build the Port Hills Tunnel was an extraordinary one. The cost of £200,000 was enormous, for the population of Canterbury was at the time less than 10,000 people. This was one of the earliest rock tunnels in the world. Certainly the first to be carved through the thick wall of an extinct volcano. The reasons tunneling was such a hazardous operation in the 19th century were several fold. Firstly, consider the tools and equipment they had. Picks, shovels, hammers and crude rock drills and horses and wagons to haul away the rubble. And instead of modern explosives, they only had gunpowder. But deep in the hot underground environment, the acrid fumes of burnt gunpowder lay thickly against the workings at the tunnel face. To solve the problem of ventilation, they constructed this false ceiling along just below the roof of the tunnel and sealed it off near the trial shafts at East End. By building a fire up here below the bottom of the shaft, it created a chimney effect so that a draft was created drawing fumes away from the working face and bringing fresh air into the men working at the front. Have you ever thought of how you can dig a tunnel through a mountain from both ends at once and then meet exactly on line in the middle of your mountain? Well, here in the Port Hills Tunnel, they solved this one by using fire again. Firstly, they surveyed a line over the Port Hills exactly on the line of the tunnel and then erected a tower on the top of the hill so it could be seen from both ends. By setting up a theodolite at either end of the tunnel, they could sight up to the tower and then carry that line of sight into the tunnel, thereby signalling to an assistant down near the working face in the dark who held a lit candle, we could place the candle exactly over the centre line and then drive a peg into the floor of the tunnel right on line. It was an idea that was simple but effective, as in fact many engineering solutions are. A few years after the Port Hills Tunnel was opened in 1867, a visionary of the time, Julius Vogel, who was colonial treasurer, convinced the government of the day to embark on a massive railway works program right throughout New Zealand. Vogel established a public works department and five years later, contracts were underway for thousands of kilometres of railway construction, financed by huge overseas loans. Thank you. 
1875 was the peak year. The equivalent of one and a half kilometers of track was being laid every day. It was an extraordinary effort for a young country and only 50 years after the very first railway opened in Britain. But it was railways on the cheap. And as we will see later, cheap railway construction had significant implications for the railway engineer of today. The completion of the Northern Main Trunk Line was a major engineering triumph. But the last spike couldn't have been driven without the brilliant contribution of Robert Holmes, later to become Engineer-in-Chief of the Public Works Department. The problem Holmes had was how to come off the high plateau at the foot of Mount Ruapehu down into the valley of the river flowing north to Tauramanui. You see, railway gradients are gentle, not like roads that can flow over hill and dale. And a gradient of 1 in 50 was set for the main trunk. That is, for a length travelled of 50 metres, say, you could climb 1 metre. The drop from the plateau was 220 metres. That required a line 11 kilometres long at the gradients of 1 in 50, but the distance up the side of the valley was only 5.5 kilometres. So somehow, Holmes had to double the distance of the line. Earlier surveys had been unsatisfactory. Much heavy construction and several major viaducts would have been involved. One afternoon, following a survey of the valley just north of Rauarimu, Holmes was sitting down with his survey assistant, pondering over his papers, when suddenly a solution came to him. It's a solution still working today. By circling the line around on itself, descent is achieved at the required grade through the use of curves and tunnels. In this way, Holmes doubled the length of line from the plateau top to the valley floor. Robert Holmes made his claim to fame by engineering the completion of the Raurimu spiral. But really, he was only building on the work of an extraordinary engineer, John Rochefort, who did all the early surveys. It was Rochefort who was responsible for the final location of a difficult section on the line between Wellington and Wairapa, over the Rumatakas. Once again, this was the story of the way through being barred by an apparently insurmountable obstacle. As at Raorimu, the first solution was not a way through, but a way over. Part of the secret to the way over the Rumatakis is being restored here in this engine in Featherston. From here, it looks like an ordinary steam locomotive. But come and look underneath. It's really quite different. Hidden away here is an extra set of driving wheels. These provided a sideways grip on a central third rail, enabling the sturdy engine to operate up inclines almost twice as steep as conventional types. For 80 years, these fell engines operated over the sharp curves, steep grades, and 19 tunnels of the Rumataka incline. Originally developed for the Mount Cenus Pass in Europe, they really came into world prominence here in New Zealand. Only one accident occurred in those 80 years. Shortly after the line opened, a windstorm blew a train off the line and timber windbreaks were installed. The fell system lasted until 1955. And that year, the longest tunnel in the British Commonwealth, in fact at the time it was 14th longest in the world, was opened seven and a half kilometers under the Rimatakas. And the fell engines then took their place in history. This tunnel is shaped like a rail tunnel, but I guess that's not surprising, as it was New Zealand's first road tunnel. They used the same tunnelling techniques here at Mount Victoria and Wellington that had been used on railway construction, and this is the man who built it. Arnold Downer was New Zealand's leading tunnel engineer, 
establishing one of the country's largest construction companies. He rated tunnelling as the most hazardous of civil engineering activities, requiring exceptional teamwork and a special breed of construction worker. Vernon Swan has just retired after a lifetime of tunnelling, much of it with the Downers team. I started off with Downers on the Rimataka Tunnel. The uh, Ministry of Works uh, broke the portals of the Rimataka Tunnel and it was the first major contract let in those years uh, to an overseas contract for tunnelling work. And we were with the Ministry and we had the option of going with, a, with an overseas firm and we thought we could learn something or they could teach us something, so we're all for it. So that's how I started off with the joint venture with Downers with an overseas company. What sort of hazards does a tunneler face, in fact? Well, cave-ins and loose ground, uh, rock falling on top of you, and uh, if you haven't got the right support in, uh, blast, uh, detonation of carelessness, work, or holes being drilled and charged and not exploded. There's various things. Arnold Downer rated tunnelling as one of the most hazardous of civil engineering activities. What attracts a man to a job like tunnelling? Well, I think it's just a, a, the venture of, of, of it. You, you don't know what's in front of you, and uh, you just got to play it, play it by ear, more or less. And uh, you know, every, every foot of ground, is, it, it can change and be different. The unexpected in tunnelling can be reduced by thorough geotechnical investigation. And Wellington's Terrace Tunnel has probably been the most thoroughly investigated in New Zealand's engineering history. Alex Gray was in charge of this project for the Ministry of Works and Development. The things involved were things like a full-length pilot tunnel to assess the actual ground the, new, the main tunnel would go through. Also, uh, shafts were uh, drilled from the surface and also about 30 small pilot boreholes where they took samples of the material to quite deep depths, including below the depth of the tunnel. I think having it in the middle of a city made it much more difficult because Unlike a lot of the tunnels in New Zealand, which are in a sort of bush environment, and it doesn't matter if the trees or the possums sort of sink down a bit, um, here we've got a large number of uh, houses up above the tunnel, and human beings are much more sensitive to movement than, say, the birds and the bees. We had good relations with all the house owners, and uh, I got to know quite a large number of them on a personal basis. The sort of things that went wrong were things like doors sticking, water pipes breaking, uh, gaps in walls, cracks opening, nothing of a risk that would endanger human life, but mainly of a sort of inconvenient sort of hazard. I, I presume exposures were used during construction. What precautions were taken in using these? Right. The use of explosives was limited to uh, the absolute minimum necessary to remove the hard rock. Fortunately, the tunnelling machines that we had were able to cope with the majority of the weathered material that was struck in this tunnel. It was only at the northern end where there was some fairly unweathered grey wacky that explosives had to be used. In those circumstances, we advised all the householders to uh, be prepared for the odd bang. And uh, we did get one or two complaints, but uh, once people realised what was going on, the fact that it was, wasn't really likely to endanger their house, they were quite happy. But it is rail tunnels rather than road tunnels that still dominate New Zealand's transport network. Some of the early ones may have been amazing achievements for their time, but they left the modern railway engineer with a real challenge. The one kilometre long Poro Taro tunnel on the watershed between the Wanganui and Mokau rivers is a good example. This tunnel was built on the main trunk line. It was started in 1885 and the only access was a Maori track. It was 65 kilometres to the nearest road, so the engineers and workmen lived on the site. It took three years to hand dig that one kilometre, another three to line it. However, this was still 12 years ahead of the opening of the North Island main trunk. And by the time the rails reached here, the engineering standards of the day had changed and the tunnel wasn't tall enough. So, in 1907, they deepened it. But this is where the real problems began. In digging out the floor, they removed the support from the base of the brick lining, and with no foundations to hold the lining in place, the relentless earth pressure gradually squeezed the tunnel in 
until modern day trains only had about 150 millimetres clearance. And they had to slow right down in order to avoid swaying and bumping against the walls as they passed through. This was a real constraint on travel time in this area. Now they could have rebored the tunnel, but that would have disrupted mainline traffic. The answer was a new tunnel nearby. But there were still problems for today's engineers to solve. The ground here is unstable. So the new tunnel at the south end had a series of concrete piles bored deep into the ground on either side, protecting the tunnelers as they burrowed out from the north. Let's look for a moment at the steam engines of an earlier era. Notice the lines of wheels spreading the weight over the light railway lines and sleepers of those days. Shapes were rounded to fit those early tunnels. Today's massive diesel electric engines are not just heavier. The wheels displace the weight towards either end of the locomotive. Heavier, faster trains have resulted in railway engineers like Ray Ryan becoming engaged in a major modernization program. To cater for the heavier axle loads, we are now using rails, for instance, that are twice the weight of those used in the Vogel era. We're using concrete sleepers. In addition to that, we are electrifying the line, and with electric locomotives, their ability to haul heavy loads up the gradients very quickly gives us a very significant market advantage. And from the civil engineering point of view, widening cuttings, strengthening bridges to withstand earthquake forces, uh, enlarging culverts, reliability is an important factor. The Mingaweka area on the old railway alignment was particularly torturous and had many tunnels and was very prone to blockage by slipping. The tunnels needed enlarging for the larger loads, the route needed to be speeded up to get commercial advantage, and to overcome all of these instability and reliability problems, plus clearances, the new deviation was looked at on the other side of the valley. And there you can see how the sweeping alignments, the wider embankments and the no tunnels has in fact achieved all the objectives that were set out to do to improve the railway system through that particular area. The necessity for viaducts such as this has been the nature of New Zealand's young and vigorous geological history. The valleys and ravines that have provided many of the obstacles facing engineers through the years are the products of the forces of water. And dealing with this element is something for us to consider in the next program.